A very good evening aspirants. We are happy to announce the results of the much awaited October main scholarship test. These are the top 5 performers. These candidates will receive a 100% merit scholarship in our GS main storming test series 2020. And then these next top 5 performers, they will receive a 50% merit scholarship. We congratulate the winners of the main scholarship test and best wishes to all the participants of this scholarship test. Additionally, for the benefit of students during these challenging times, we wish to support the meritorious students so that they prepare well for their upcoming mains exam, which is a deciding factor in the UPSC Civil Services examination. Hence, the next top 100 rank holders of this October mains scholarship test 2020, that is those who have secured the ranks from 11th to 110th will be awarded a 25% merit scholarship. And one more good news is there. Shankar IAS Academy is also offering a 25% merit scholarship for the 100 students who took part in July scholarship test of 2020. That is those students who have secured the ranks from 4th to 103 in the July scholarship test 2020 will receive a 25% merit scholarship. We request all the eligible meritorious candidates to fill the registration form in order to avail these scholarships. And all the required links for these are given in the description box and also in the comment section. For more details regarding merit scholarship, call us at 6379784702 or you can also email to mainstorming at shankarias.in. We once again congratulate all the meritorious candidates. And those candidates who are not on the merit list don't be disheartened. Keep writing the answers for the main questions that appear in our daily Hindi news analysis. So with this announcement, let's begin today's Hindi news analysis for the date 18th October 2020. These are the list of articles chosen for today's analysis. Let's move on to the first discussion. This discussion is based on this article which talks about the United Nations Human Rights Council. It is in news since last week, the United Nations General Assembly held elections for 15 new council members. So in this context, let's briefly know about UNHRC and also the election process. First know that United Nations Human Rights Council or UNHRC replaced the former United Nations Commission on Human Rights. And this United Nations Human Rights Council is an intergovernmental body within the UN system. It was established in 2006 by United Nations General Assembly and it is a subsidiary body of the General Assembly which makes it directly accountable to the full membership of United Nations. And note that UNHRC directly reports to the United Nations General Assembly. The Human Rights Council or UNHRC is responsible for strengthening the promotion and protection of human rights around the globe. And it is also responsible for addressing situations of human rights violations and make recommendations on them. But here, generally, when we talk about UNHRC, there is a confusion with Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, that is OHCHR. But note that UNHRC is different from OHCHR. OHCHR is an UN office and it is shortly called as UN Human Rights. But whereas the UNHRC is shortly known as Human Rights Council. And the main difference is that OHCHR is part of UN Secretariat, whereas UNHRC is a subsidiary body of UN General Assembly. So OHCHR and UNHRC both are completely distinct entities. But one common thing between them is that OHCHR is headquartered at Geneva in Switzerland and the Human Rights Council also meets at the UN office in Geneva. But today we are discussing about the membership in the council. The membership is important because after elected as a member, the new members commit themselves to cooperating with the council and they commit to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. So in this manner, the council ensures these commitments through two of its key functions. These key functions are the universal periodic review and the second one is an overseeing expert investigation of violations in specific countries. This is also known as special procedures. Now under the first function that is UPR, the members of the council are reviewed during their term of membership. And through this mechanism, the council undertakes a periodic review of the fulfillment of the human rights obligations and commitments of all member states of the United Nations, not only the UNHRC members. So this review is a cooperative mechanism which is based on an interactive dialogue and it ensures universality of coverage and equal treatment of all states. So what UNHRC actually does is, 
under the upr it will assess the extent to which the states respect their human rights obligations that are set out in these documents so when the members commit gross and systematic violations of human rights then the unga that is united nations general assembly can even suspend the rights of their membership in the council so now let us come to the main focus of our discussion which is the membership know that the human rights council has 47 members based on equitable geographical distribution these 47 members are members of united nations and they are elected by the united nations general assembly and the seats are distributed among regional groups as given here now with respect to india know that currently india is a member in human rights council india was elected as a member from january 2019 for a term of 3 years so the membership of india ends in december 2021 but remember this is not the first time india is holding the membership of the council because the previous term of india expired in 2017 and then after that from 2019 india is a member of the council so from this you can easily say that the members are eligible for re-election but there is an exception to this that is the members are not eligible for immediate re-election after serving two consecutive terms now when we discuss about the unhrc membership remember about usa because usa left unhrc in the year 2018 stating the reason that unhrc has an anti israel view and this withdrawal of usa from unhrc gave chance to china to dominate in the council according to the current tenure of china it retires as a member in december 2020 itself now let us come to the today's news the news is that last week UN General Assembly held elections for selecting 15 members for UNHRC. These are the 15 members and they will serve for 3 years starting from January 2021 till December 2023. And as you can see here China is re-elected as a member. Not only China, even Senegal, Nepal, Pakistan, Ukraine, Mexico have also been re-elected. but here china's membership is controversial because there are allegations that china is diluting the concept of universal values and it is promoting its own world view on human rights so on a whole if you see what are the positives of the council the first one is that the council is fairly representative of the general assembly without special privileges for the more developed western countries because such kind of special privileges for uh, the more developed western countries exist in other multilateral institutions such as imf and world bank but that does not happen here but here you should note that not all the un member states have served as a member of human rights council only 117 out of 193 un member states have served as members of uh, hrc as of january 2020 Then the second positive is the UPR that is Universal Periodic Review and the collaboration that happens in that process. But beyond these positives the council is often under criticism because several of its members are in violation of its proclaimed aims. For example if we take China it follows the one party systems and if we take Russia which has been elected as a member in this 2020 election it has anti-gay policies. If you remember on our 3rd July 2020 in the news analysis we discussed the amendments to Russian constitution and one of the important amendments was a ban on same sex marriage by declaring protection of institution of marriage as the union of man and a woman that is under their constitution only the union of a man and a woman is recognized as marriage so this bans the same sex marriage therefore it is a glaring human rights violation but even then Russia has been elected as a member now So like this the council is often criticized due to its members but even among the criticisms the council is functioning better than its predecessor commission which is the United Nations Commission on Human Rights because the council has investigated and strongly condemned the violation of various human rights in several countries such as the violation of human rights in Israel Syria Iran North Korea Cambodia Belarus Eritrea etc so that means the council has to improve its functioning so these are some of the information that you should know with respect to united nations human rights council or simply the human rights council and let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this faq article which discusses about the auction theory the auction theory assumes significance since two economists from usa have won nobel prize for economics for making improvements to auction theory and for making inventions of new auction formats So in this context let us discuss about the auction theory and the works done by the Nobel laureates the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first year note that in the year 1968 Sveriges Riksbank that is the Sweden's central bank established the Sveriges Riksbank 
prize in economic sciences in the memory of Alfred Nobel. So technically, the prize awarded for economic sciences is not a Nobel Prize, but it is identified with the Nobel Award. And to know more about the Nobel Prizes, you can refer our 10th October Hindu News Analysis where we have discussed in detail about the Nobel Prizes. So colloquially, this prize is known as the Nobel for Economics. So this year's Nobel for Economics was awarded jointly to Paul R. Milgram and Robert B. Wilson. They have been awarded this prize for improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. Now to understand their work, first we need to understand what is meant by auction. An auction is a system of buying and selling goods or services by offering them for bidding. That is allowing people to bid and then selling to the highest bidder. The bidders compete against each other and in this each subsequent bid is higher than the previous bid. So this is the general scenario. Once an item is placed for sale, the auctioneer, that is the person who conducts the auctions, will start at a relatively low price to attract a large number of bidders for that product. And the price increases each time someone makes new higher bid until finally no other bidders are willing to offer more than the most recent bid. And the highest bidder takes the item. An auction is considered complete when the vendor accepts the highest bid offered and the buyer pays for the goods or services and takes possession of those goods or services. This simply, for example, there is an item A and the auctioneer starts the bidding at 1 rupees. Now the first bidder offers 100 rupees and the second bidder offers 150 rupees, then the third bidder offers 200 rupees, then the fourth bidder offers 500 rupees. Then after that, no one makes any highest bid. So the most recent bid here is the 500 rupees. So here this item A will go to this highest bidder only who has made this 500 rupees bid. So this is how generally auctions work. You might have come across auctions being conducted for the sale of antiques, rare collectibles and paintings. But know that auctions are used in multiple sectors also like agriculture, spectrum, investment securities, etc. So now our next question is what is auction theory? Auction theory is a branch of economics that deals with auctions. Using this auction theory, researchers try to understand the outcomes of different rules for bidding and final prices. That is, they try to understand the auction format. Now, the analysis of the auction is difficult because bidders behave strategically. They behave based on the available information. The bidders take into consideration both what they know themselves and also what they believe other bidders to know. Now, in this regard, both the laureates have been awarded for their individual as well as a joint contribution in auction theory. Both of them have studied individually on how auctions work. They have also used their insights and collaborated together to design new auction formats for goods and services that are difficult to sell in a traditional way. So first, let us see the individual contributions. One of the Nobel laureates, Robert Wilson, developed the theory for auctions of objects with a common value. This is the value which is uncertain beforehand but in the end it is the same for everyone. For example, you can take the future value of uh, radio frequencies or the volume of minerals available in a particular area. In this, Wilson showed why rational bidders have the tendency to place bids below their own best estimate of the common value. The reason is because they are worried about the winner's curse. Winner's curse is nothing but the feeling that they are paying too much and they are losing out. So Robert Wilson is known for this common value. Then the other Nobel laureate, Paul Milgram, he formulated a more general theory of auctions that not only allows common values, but it also allows private values that vary from bidder to bidder due to the bidder's unique circumstances. He analyzed the bidding strategies in a number of well-known auction formats. He demonstrated that a format will give the seller higher expected revenue when the bidders learn more about each other's estimated values during bidding. In particular, Dr. Paul Milgram showed how Dutch auctions can help sellers earn more revenues than English auctions. So to understand this, first we have to know about the types of auctions. First is the English auction. It is also known as the open outcry auction. It is the most commonly used type today and it is an open ascending price auction. 
Here the auctioneer, that is the person who conducts the auctions, announces the prices. And the bidders call out their bids until no participant is willing to bid higher. Like the example which we saw. And the process ends when the auctioneer accepts the highest final bid. You would have seen this kind of bid in movies also. And this kind of auction is commonly used for selling wine, antiques, tobacco etc. Now the next type is the Dutch auction. This is an open descending price auction where the auctioneer starts with a high asking price and then lowers the price or the bid until one of the bidders is willing to accept the auctioneer's price or when the seller's reserve price is achieved. And in this Dutch auction, the goods for sale are allocated based on the bid order where the first highest bidder picks their items followed by the second highest bidder and this continues until the order has been exhausted. And this kind of auction is used for perishable commodities such as flowers and occasionally for investment securities also. There is also one more type of auction which is the sealed bid auction. This sealed bid auction is also known as the blind auction. Here all bidders submit sealed bids simultaneously so that no bidder gets to know the bid of their competitors. This type of auction you would have often heard in the government contract tendering, mining leases etc. So from all these different types of auctions you can see that people either have always sold things to the highest bidder or they bought them from whoever makes the cheapest offer. The second type happens when there is government tendering etc. So ultimately here both the buyers and the sellers benefit from auctions. Now in this regard Dr. Milgram showed how Dutch auctions can help sellers earn more revenues than English auctions. Because as we saw in the case of English auctions the price rises based on higher bids that is submitted by competing buyers. But as soon as some of the bidders drop off of the auction as the price rises then the remaining bidders become more cautious about bidding higher prices. So the seller's revenue will be affected to a particular extent. But this is not the case in Dutch auctions. Because here the seller starts with the highest bid then slowly reduces it. Hence, Dutch auctions can help sellers earn more revenues than the English auctions. And based on this, Dr. Milgram disproved the traditional auction theory which is called as the Revenue Equivalence Theorem. This Revenue Equivalence Theorem believed that all auctions are the same in terms of generating revenues for sellers. And this has been disproved by Dr. Milgram. So these are the individual contributions of both these laureates. Now they have also made joint contribution that is they have devised new real world auction formats. Both of these laureates have invented new formats for auctioning off many interrelated objects simultaneously on behalf of a seller. For example, spectrum rights auction. See spectrum is a complex good as well as a scarce resource. So earlier what governments did was governments sold spectrum rights on a piecemeal basis as individual units. So this made the spectrum auctioning unappealing to companies and this also led to private speculators earning billions in the secondary market by reselling the spectrum which they bought from the government. So the government lost the revenues which it could have otherwise made if it had better auction designs. So keeping this in mind the laureates designed an auction model to sell spectrum in bundles instead of individual units. This generated revenue for the governments and it also resulted in broad societal benefit. Hence it became helpful for the governments and this method for the first time was used in the year 1994 by the US government where it used the auction formats to sell radio frequencies to telecom operators. Since then many other countries have followed the same formats. So as a conclusion what you should understand is that the contributions of Dr. Milgram and Dr. Wilson have helped the governments and even private companies to design their auctions better and this has in turn helped in the better allocation of scarce resources and it has offered more incentives for sellers to produce complex goods. Hence their discoveries have benefited sellers, buyers and taxpayers around the world. So this is the information that you should know with respect to auction theory. With this we come to the end of this discussion. Now next discussion is a small discussion about the Golconda fort in Hyderabad which is based on this news article. The article mentions that the relentless rain in Hyderabad has ravaged the 500 year old Golconda fort. So in this context let us know about some details of the fort. This fort is located in the western part of Hyderabad city. The fort was originally a mud fort and it was built under the reign of Raja of Warangal of the Kakatiya dynasty. 
it was built on a hill top and later it was fortified that is later it was strengthened to protect against the attack between the centuries of 14th and 17th centuries and this was done by the bahmani sultans and then by the qutub shahi dynasty when they were ruling so currently the inner part of the fort contains ruins of palaces mosques and a hill top pavilion which rises about 130 meters high So Golconda Fort is undoubtedly one of the most magnificent fortress complexes in India and this fortress rests on a granite hill initially it was called as the shepherd's hill which means golconda in telugu also know that the outermost enclosure of this fort is called as fateh darwaza which means victory gate it was named like this after aurangzeb's army marched successfully through this gate Here remember that the Qutub Shahi monuments of Hyderabad then the Golconda fort then Qutub Shahi tombs and charminar are part of the tentative list of India which are waiting in order to qualify for the inclusion in the world heritage list so they are just in the tentative list they have not yet been awarded the world heritage tag so in this context just know that the Qutub Shahi dynasty was founded by the Sultan Quli Qutb Shah and he ruled the Golconda region from 1518 AD to 1687 AD and the fourth king of the dynasty that is the king Muhammad Quli Qutb Shah is the founder of the Hyderabad city so the capital of Qutb Shahi kingdom was shifted from the Golconda to Hyderabad so during the reign of the Qutb Shahi dynasty seven rulers ruled the dynasty and they ruled for 170 years that is they successfully registered the mogal attack till 1687 ad so in this context know that the qutb shahi dynasty was the last kingdom to be absorbed in the expanding mogal empire under aurangzeb so these are some of the information that you should know with respect to golconda fort and the qutb shahi dynasty now let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this news article which talks about the recently held elections in new zealand In this election the sitting prime minister of New Zealand Jacinda Ardern's party has again won and according to the news article her political party which is the Labour Party of New Zealand will form the first single party government in decades it is because since the year 1996 no party has been able to govern without the support from other groups that is so far they have been forming the government based on coalition and now only the labor party of new zealand has won enough seats to form a single party government in new zealand so in this context let us discuss about new zealand's geography history and political system the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference first know that new zealand is also known as aotearoa new zealand it is an island country in the south pacific ocean it is the south westernmost part of polynesia and it lies southeast of australia so its nearest neighbor is australia only and this island country comprises of two main islands one is the north island and the second one is the southern island and it also has a number of small islands its capital city is wellington but its largest urban area is auckland and both of these cities are situated in the north island only now geographically the important point to note here is that the landforms of new zealand are shaped by its location it is located on the boundary of pacific tectonic plate and the indo australian tectonic plate so because of the resulting earth movements due to this location over 2/3 of the land of new zealand is covered with hilly and mountainous terrain and this location also leads to frequent earthquakes in most part of the country and this has also made the central north island as a zone of volcanic activity and geothermal activity apart from this remember that new zealand is a part of ring of fire ring of fire is the circum pacific seismic belt that is marked by frequent earthquakes and considerable volcanic activity and as we just saw that new zealand as a country is located on the boundary of two tectonic plates specifically know that the north island and the western part of the south island are on the indian australian plate and the remainder of the south island is on the pacific plate and their collision only creates violent seismic activity in subduction zones and along the faults so these are some of the geographical details that you should know with respect to new zealand now let us discuss its history in brief the new zealand was comprised of polynesian maori people these polynesian maori people reached new zealand sometime between 1250 and 1300 ad and then in 1964 the dutch explorer abel tasman became the first european to reach the new zealand and then he named the island as the staten land then after this in 1645 itself 
the Dutch cartographers renamed the island as Nova Zealandia after the Dutch province of Zealand. Then in 1769, the British explorer Captain James Cook anglicized the name Nova Zealandia to New Zealand when he mapped the islands. So when he say anglicized, it means renaming it into English. So the Dutch name of Nova Zealandia was renamed in English as New Zealand. Then in the year 1840, the Maori chief entered into an agreement with Great Britain. It is called as the Treaty of Waitangi. In this treaty, the chief of Maori people ceded sovereignty to the Queen Victoria of England, but the chief retained the territorial rights. And in the same year, the British began the first organized colonial settlement in New Zealand. But after that, there were series of land wars between the period 1843 and 1872 among the Britishers and the Maori people. But in the end, the native Maori people were defeated. Then in the year 1907, the British colony of New Zealand became an independent dominion. and it also supported the united kingdom's military in both the world wars but even though by 1920s new zealand controlled almost all of its internal and external policies it became fully independent only in the year 1947 when it adopted the statute of westminster i know that the british parliament passed this statute of westminster with an objective to grant complete autonomy to its dominions so this is the brief history Now based on this let us see some of the facts about the polity of New Zealand. New Zealand is a parliamentary democracy under a constitutional monarchy. New Zealand's legislative system is a unicameral house of representatives and it is commonly called as parliament. And know that the members of the parliament serve 3 year terms. And as we saw in the beginning now in the recent elections the Labour Party of New Zealand has won enough seats so it will be forming the single party government under the prime ministership of Jacinda Ardern. So these are some of the information that you should know with respect to New Zealand. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Let's move on to the next discussion. This discussion is based on this article from the Sunday Magazine. It talks about the Biological Diversity Act and its implementation status. In this regard, it also talks about the People's Biodiversity Register, the Biodiversity Management Committee, etc. So in this discussion, we'll see these in detail. and this discussion will help you in prelims as well as in mains preparation see as you know biodiversity is very crucial for the functioning of ecosystems so the biological diversity act was enacted in the year 2002 now the purpose of this biodiversity act is to realize equitable sharing of benefits which is arising out of the use of biological resources and associated knowledge so in this regard the act covers the protection of traditional knowledge and equitable sharing of benefits which is arising out of the use of such traditional knowledge it also has other objectives such as conservation then sustainable use of biological resources etc and we also have a biological diversity rules of 2004 now the act and the rules are implemented in india through a decentralized system and for this a three tiered structure has been established under the act at the national state and local levels at the local level the biodiversity management committees are to be established by institutions of the local self government this is for the implementation of specific provisions of the act and rules and then at the state level the state biodiversity boards are to be established and then at the national level the national biodiversity authority is to be established these are to be established to deal with the matters relating to the implementation of the act and the rules so each of these structures are required to be connected for decision making processes on various issues including the issues of access and benefit sharing and here just remember that all of these institutions are statutory autonomous bodies established under the biological diversity act of 2002 and as we just now saw the act provides protection for traditional knowledge and as the article correctly states the traditional knowledge of forest dwellers fisher folks pastoralists and hunting communities about the biodiversity was never considered to be on par with the formal research so due to this the private companies exploited the traditional knowledge to extract natural resources and these communities even were not rewarded for this contribution in any way so to stop this exploitation and to bring in the rich knowledge of these local communities for their benefit as well as for the benefit of the nation the national biodiversity authority has issued a set of guidelines and it has provided financial support for the establishment and operationalization of biodiversity management committees 
So, what are the roles of BMCs? According to the Rule 22, Sub Rule 6 of the Biological Diversity Rules 2004, the BMCs' main function is to prepare the People's Biodiversity Register. See, this People's Biodiversity Register or PBR is a legal document that contains details of biological resources which are occurring within a BMC. and it also contains the associated knowledge of these biological resources as well now this information is critical for the conservation and for the sustainable monitoring of biological resources at local level further a pbr also helps in identification of a beneficiary with whom benefits can be shared when an associated benefit sharing agreement becomes operational so these registers are used to identify the bmcs from where the biological resources are accessed and then the benefits will be provided to the local biodiversity funds which are maintained by the biodiversity management committees so in this regard only this news article covers the effectiveness of the biological diversity act and creating the pbrs in this regard the article mentions that by the year 2016 only 9700 bmcs had been set up for the 270000 local bodies across the country this is even less than 5% of what should have been established so that means if bmcs are not established then pbrs would not have been prepared so that means still the forest dwellers fisher folks pastoralists and hunting communities were subjected to exploitation and this also means that the act was not implemented properly so due to this an order was passed by the national green tribunal in the year 2016 and in this order ngt directed 100 percentage compliance in the constitution of bmcs and in the creation of pbrs by january 31st 2020 Here, NGT also stated that the states will be fined from February first, two thousand twenty, if they fail to comply with this order, and the fine will be rupees ten lakh per month. So after this only, the states started to establish the BMCs and they started preparing the PBRs. But now the deadline has crossed, and according to the article, around one lakh ninety thousand PBRs have been completed, or they are in various stages of preparation. so that means still only 70% of the country's pbr is prepared so now let us wait and see whether ngt finds the states for non compliance as it said in the 2016 order or whether it pardons the delay in establishing bmcs due to the pandemic so these are some of the information that you should know with respect to the implementation of biological diversity act and people's biodiversity register now let's move on to the next discussion Our next discussion is based on this small snippet which talks about a new material that is showing signs of superconductivity at room temperature. According to researchers, this material conducts electricity without resistance up to 15 degrees Celsius. But the only problem with the material is that this superconductivity property survives only under pressures such as the pressures which are found at the center of the earth. So in this context let's know what do we mean by superconductors and their applications see a superconductor is a material such as a pure metal like aluminum or lead and when these metals are cooled to ultra low temperatures they allow electricity to move through them with absolutely zero resistance in simple words we can say that a superconductor is a material that can conduct electricity or that can transport electrons from one atom to another without any resistance below a certain temperature This means that no heat, sound or any other form of energy would be released from the material when it has reached the critical temperature or the temperature at which the material becomes superconductive. But unfortunately, most materials must be in an extremely low energy state that is they have to be very cold in order to become superconductive. And just know that superconductors come in two different types, type 1 and type 2. type 1 superconductor consists of basic conductive elements that are used in everything like from electrical wiring to computer microchips and then type 2 superconductor is composed of metallic compounds such as copper or lead they reach a superconductive state at much higher temperatures when compared to type 1 superconductors so where these superconductors are used one of its main applications is the magnetic levitation that is the transport vehicles such as trains can be made to float on strong superconducting magnets and this virtually eliminates the friction between the train and its tracks then another area where superconductors are used is the life saving function in the field of biomagnetism which we know as the mri scanning here also superconductors are used 
Then in the electronics industry, the ultra high performance filters are now being built with superconductors. Then superconductors have also found widespread applications in the military because now significantly smaller motors are being built by US Navy for their ships using superconducting wires and tapes. So like this, superconductors have many applications. So that is all about superconductors. Now we have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. Now this question is a pair based question on one side communities are given and on the other side countries are given and we have to choose the incorrectly matched pair. Now the first pair is Uyghur Russia. This is incorrect because Uyghurs are ethnic minorities in China. So that means one should be in answer. Then from today's discussion you can say that third pair is also incorrect because Maoris are indigenous inhabitants of New Zealand not Lebanon. So three should also be an answer. If you know these two, then you can easily arrive at the correct answer, which is option D, one, two, and three. And here the yes, these, they are not the inhabitants of Greece. Rather, they are the persecuted religious minorities in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, etc. Now this question was framed based on this 2016 prelims question for which the correct answer is option C, two and three only because Kurds are related to Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. Now this next question, if you see, Three dynasties are given Kakatiya dynasty, Qutub Shahi dynasty, Bahamani Sultanate. Which of the above Sultanates or dynasties is or are involved in the construction and modification of Golconda fort? Now, during discussion, we saw that all the three were involved in the construction and also in the modification of Golconda fort. So, the correct answer is option D 1, 2, and 3. With this, we come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment, and share. Do subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation.